Talk about guide. Leicester Square, Soho, Chinatown. As well as taking you to the best known places of interest in the area, the Talk About Guide to Leicester Square, Soho and Chinatown, London will give you some historical background too. The guide is simple to follow. Play it through and run it over and over again if you wish. Here's the map that I'm using. We're starting off at Leicester Square Underground Station. So we come out of Leicester Square Tube here, turn right and right again. Coventry Street leads to Leicester Square. But just as you go past Warner Multi Cinema in Leicester is Leicester Place. Up here you'll find the London French Catholic Church, which was originally built in 1856, was bombed in 1940 and reopened in 1956. A very beautiful little church. It has murals by Jean Cocteau in the Lady Chapel. Next door to this is the Prince Charles Cinema, probably the cheapest cinema in London, if not in the UK and the only cinema where the auditorium slopes upwards towards the screen. Ignoring Leicester Place, go past the Hagen Dust ice cream shop and you can see a square in front of you. This is Leicester Square. This area, now known as Leicester Square, was at one time, around 1200 AD, fields and open land, owned by the abbot of Westminster Abbey. But in 1536, when King Henry VIII took ownership of the church lands all over England, this piece was amongst them. King Henry's daughter, Queen Elizabeth I, inherited it and gave it to one of her court favourites, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester and it became known as Leicester Fields. Dudley's nephew built Leicester House. Other fashionable houses were built round a square in 1717 when Leicester House was bought by Prince George, later King George II. He set out formal gardens with stone walls and iron railings removing washing lines and wooden fences which had been used for sheep and pigs. Famous people who lived in the square include Joshua Reynolds, William Hunter, Sir Isaac Newton and William Hogarth. These four busts can be seen at the corners of Leicester Square Station, sorry Leicester Square Gardens. By the 19th century, a statue of King George I had been placed in the centre of the gardens. George had not been a very popular king. A German, he spoke very little English. Eventually, the statue was vandalised and the square became a disgrace. As part of the reconstruction, George's statue was moved and a copy of Westminster Abbey's William Shakespeare put in its place. It was said that you could see the statue of George at the bottom of the Haymarket in Pall Mall, but when I looked all I could find was a statue of George the Third. During the last century theatres and musicals were all the were in their heyday, the Alhambra the Empire and the Hippodrome to name but three. Theatres are still very popular in London but all have gone from Leicester Square. The Square was also famous for boxing booths, oyster cellars and Turkish baths. By 1918 cinemas were coming into their own and Charlie Chaplin 
was all the rage. The London born, ac born actor made a tremendous contribution to the film industry and this has been commemorated by the statue facing Shakespeare. Here it is. Born in 1889, Charlie had started it in a children's dance group later going to America where he joined the Max Sennett Keystone Company. He went on to co-found United Artists to make dozens of films and to receive a knighthood from Queen Elizabeth II in 1975. Sadly, he died in 1977. Leicester Square was upgraded in 1990 with the addition of brass plates depicting the distance to capitals of the Commonwealth, information boards at the various entrance gates, and busts of great, uh, of great men who'd lived in the area. At the bottom of the square is a rather grand one-story building. More of that anon. Around the outside of the square, handprints of the Hollywood stars were made in brass and set into the pavements. Three popular English film stars to be found round about are Sean Connery, Hugh Grant and Michael Caine. Now if you look at this picture, it shows a premiere just about to start and crowds building up. Here's the aftermath of a premiere with the place littered, barriers up and removing screens and things. This one was for Julia Roberts. The building at the bottom of Leicester Square was built at a cost of £75,000 in 1991 to hide an electricity substation. The part of it not used for passing on electricity is given over to a very important tourist attraction, returned theatre tickets. Go here after 12 o'clock on any theatre day and you can queue for tickets at half price. If you carry on in this direction down St. Martin's Street you'll come to a Chinese church, Westminster Public Library and the rear entrance to the National Gallery. Also in this direction the National Portrait Gallery, St. Martin's in the Fields and Trafalgar Square. Now to the north of Leicester Square a whole new building replacing the old Swiss centre with its bell glockenspiel which played at hourly intervals. At the end of this new glass building is Wardour Street. If you've walked up here you're now walking into Soho and Chinatown. Now Soho is bounded by Coventry Street on the south, Oxford Street to the north, Charing Cross to the east and Regent Street to the west. Chinatown is part of Soho. If instead of going up Wardour Street you continue along Coventry Street you'll come to the Trocadero Centre with its shops, exhibitions, seven cinemas, four levels of entertainment and its grand array of restaurants, bars and snack places. An ideal place for a visit especially on a rainy day or dull evening. The origin of the word Soho goes back to the time when this area was a hunting field and a cry of Soho would urge hunters on after fox or deer. At one time it was a very fashionable quarter. John Duke of Monmouth, a natural son of the restored king, King Charles II, had a house here, as did John Dryden, writer, poet and dramatist. Soho has long been famous not only 
as a cosmopolitan dining area, but also for its girly and cabaret bars. Between the World Wars, the Windmill Theatre was famous for its nude tableau. English law stated that nudity was acceptable and artistic, providing the models didn't move. This, by the way, is the Trocadero Centre. Here we can see signs of the sex industry. Comedians Peter Sellers and Tommy Trinder had spots at the Windmill Theatre. The theatre's proud boast was that, despite the bombs of the war, we never closed, but eventually closed because of the more liberal nudism laws in the early 1960s. It was at this time that Soho became the centre of the coffee bar scene when young people would sit for hours drinking frothy coffee from newly imported Italian machines. Skiffle groups grew out of the coffee bar movement and singers like Tommy Steele started their careers in such bars. Go under the first of three Chinese arches where the sign in Chinese says Chinatown. Walk along past a great variety of restaurants and you will come to two, two Chinese lions presented in 1985 by the People's Republic of China. Here the street names are given in both English and Chinese. At the end of the street is this tiny Chinese pavilion. Here's one of those gateways. Chinatown becomes even more packed than usual for the Chinese New Year when dragons will visit every Chinese establishment. Opposite the Chinese lions is Macclesfield Street. On the right side of this is De Hem's London's only Dutch bar. This has been a popular international tavern since 1688 and was a meeting place for the Dutch resistance in World War II. You need not limit yourself in Soho to Chinese food, for restaurants of all nationalities abound – Italian, Greek, French, Vietnamese, Japanese, and even the English. Now, once across Shaftesbury Avenue, named after Lord Shaftesbury, the philanthropist who worked to improve the lives of four children, on your left as you walk is St Anne's Tower, all that is left of the original church after the bombing of World War II. Built between 1677 and 1685, it was probably designed by Sir Christopher Wren or William Talman, or possibly both. At one time the churchyard was used for burials. Some 14,000 people are, were buried in this little plot in 20 years between 1830 and 1850. This large number of burials in such a tiny space caused a health risk and the government banned further internments. On the side of St Anne's Tower are two plaques, one to William Hazlitt, writer, critic and friend of poet William Wordsworth. Hazlitt wrote profusely one of his more popular works being The Feeling of Im Immortality of Youth. The second plaque is to King Theodore of Corsica, shown on the left in a moment, who died in poverty in Soho in 1756. Dorothy L. Sayers was a church warden of St. Anne's in the 50s. She wrote numerous novels of which The Nine Tailors is the most famous and also the religious play The Once and Future King. Her ashes are buried under the tower. Nowadays St. Anne's is still a thriving parish church. The redevelopment completed in 1991 saw a new church built and the headquarters of the Soho Society. 
St. Anne's has accomplished much in its work with homeless youngsters at Centre Point. It's already been mentioned that Soho has many claims to fame. The first television picture in the world was demonstrated in Greek Street by its Scottish inventor, John Logie Beard. In 1992, the richest man in England was stated to be Paul Raymond, owner of Paint Raymond's Review Bar Theatre, together with much property in Soho. Here's the sign about the King of Corsica. Now there's a map of all what we've been looking at. Oxford Street, Regent Street, Coventry Street, Charing Cross Road, Trocadero Centre, Piccadilly, Trafalgar Square, Covent Garden, and then off to the City of London. Thank you for watching. More guides coming soon. Do leave comments.